enology is, uh, I think, a fascinating subject, since most of your enologists, rather than viticulturists, maybe it's less fascinating to you, but I think there will be some aspects that uh, will be important to you as considering how grapes respond to their environment, and of course that has some bearing on uh, how wine is made from them, or the composition of the wine that comes from them. We were just discussing the uh, local production of the phenolic substances in the cells, and we're indicating that while we didn't know a great deal about it in, in final detail, it does appear that they're produced in little sacs, vesicles, which migrate through the cytoplasm and empty into the vacuole. So by and large, the phenolic materials of a given plant cell are found uh, dissolved in the fluid of the vacuole. Uh, of course, the toughness of the cell has a lot to do with whether it then appears in any juice that you express. So if you're talking about a uh, grape, uh, you know that the central cells of the grape berry are rather easily ruptured and you produce the phenolic materials that were in that vacuole fluid along with the acids that are also in the vacuole fluid and so on so that the white juice that you get by early pressing would have the phenols from the central cells and then if you either press very hard or otherwise disrupted the much more tough uh, epidermal cells of the grape skin then you would be getting uh, the, the red color, the anthocyanin, and in fact the flavonoids in general uh, that are still in the vacuolar fluid but they're in much tougher cells and therefore more difficult to get out. So even though you might think, considering how the phenols arrive in wine, the, uh, the uh, flavonoids are not in the, in the vacuole, in fact they are just the degree of toughness of the cell and the degree of difficulty of, of breaching the cell wall to get the color, the anthocyanin, or the other flavonoid out. And as a consequence, then, uh, and we have shown using our uh, formaldehyde analysis, which again, I don't know, I think we've skirted this point a time or two, but I'm not sure we ever got it completely uh, clear. When you use flavonoid as a uh, I mean, uh, formaldehyde is a part of an analysis for flavonoid. What you're doing is you're producing first a reaction from the, with the formaldehyde to make a uh, methanolic or methylenol uh, site chain alcohol. And then a, another unit, which can be fluoroglucinol or a flavonoid A-ring, uh, will react to give uh, a similar uh, unit with the meta OH's catalyzing addition to the uh, open spots in the ring so that the end, the end product would be a methylene bridge between two flavonoids or uh, if you added fluoroglucinol, uh, fluoroglucinol and the flavonoid. You have a similarly activated position here and of course in the flavonoid there'd be substitution here or otherwise you would here also. So you can substitute again with formaldehyde and the second reaction making a methylene bridge to still another uh, unit and by keeping this up you can have a branched uh, uh, three-dimensional type structure develop and of course this means that the material gets insoluble, falls out of solution so you can precipitate the flavonoids <coughs> relatively quantitatively and if you do a total phenol analysis before and after reaction with formaldehyde in strong acid solution. It's got to be in strong acid solution because if you do it in neutral or alkaline solution, the formaldehyde will react with any other phenol, catechol or what have you. So in strongly acid solution, it's limited to reacting with the A-ring type compounds, will lead to their precipitation in a, a properly controlled, essentially quantitative fashion, and by a total phenol analysis before and after, you will determine uh, the, those that do not precipitate will be the non-flavonoids. Then if you have total first and the non-flavonoids don't <coughs> precipitate, clearly the difference would be the flavonoids. So by the two analyses we can determine uh, the three components, the flavonoid, non-flavonoid, and the total. This can be quite useful, but anyway the point I want to make now is then that in the readily expressed juice like that you'd use to make white table wine, or white wine of any kind, 
Uh, this juice would contain only the, or almost only, very low flavonoid content and almost only the non-flavonoids, mainly caffeic uh, acid derivatives like uh, chlorogenic acid and maybe the cafe oil tartrate if it's there as well, or instead. And this means that red wines and white wines, if that's the only source of such material, should have essentially the same non-flavonoid content, and it turns out they do. Tom Cramling in his master's work showed just that. He developed the analysis and showed that uh, red and white wines have essentially the same non-flavonoid content, showing then that the non-flavonoid is present in the vacuoles of the cells and in the easily expressed juice cells or the readily disrupted cells, as well probably as the epidermal cells, but in proportion there's so many fewer epidermal cells and, and you get juice yield in proportion to the vacuole contents so that uh, that would make the red wine and white wine come out the same. On the other hand, they're nowhere near the same in flavonoid content, of course. The white wines have low flavonoid content. The red wines can have very high. Uh, most of the additional total, remember we said white wines run around 300 to 50 parts per million total phenol, and the red wines generally 1,100 or more and the difference between the 300 and the 1100 would be almost completely flavonoid then. So uh, this has some bearing on the cytological uh, localization of the different phenols, but again, uh, it is the vacuole, t vacuole fluid, which would, for any one kind of cell, be the more readily expressed fluid. And of course, this has physiological importance because if you had tannins in the cytoplasm where the enzymes occur, then you'd really have a difficult problem on your hand of maintaining enzymatic activity in the cytoplasm. So that the fact that the phenols, including the tannins, are excreted, if you like, from the cytoplasm into the vacuole, and there the tonoplast or membranal structures would keep the two tissues separate. The high protein tissue of the cytoplasm that is important for enzymatic activity would be kept separate from the protein precipitin uh, type of compound in the in the vacuole which I think is ob has obvious uh, significance in terms of what goes on now where these uh, where phenols occur in tissues varies considerably we've already mentioned and for that matter from common sense you're very well aware of the fact that say flowers are often red or blue or whatever, whereas the leaves of the same plant are not. So again, the plant has the ability to make the phenols, but whether they do make them in a given tissue can be quite variable. It may be completely absent in one uh, tissue of, of a given plant and highly concentrated in another tissue of the same plant. And in fact, in such things as variegated leaves or variegated petals, uh, you know, some of these uh, petunias with striped uh, white and colored uh, uh, flower petals. This is supposedly, uh, in some cases, proven to be due to virus infection. And just why the virus would cause the variegated effect is a little bit hard to understand. I personally don't understand it. I don't believe it is understood on a biochemical level. In any case, if you look microscopically at the cells in the white stripe of the petal and the cells that are red just by it, you can't see any difference in the cells. And the, the, the physiology of the cell doesn't seem to be highly influenced, but certainly the uh, end products of the metabolism are quite different in the two. And there are some more pertinent examples. I use that only as an illustration of how variable they can be, and so you recognize it from your own experience. But in other tissues, particularly uh, related to the function of the tissue, there may be great differences. For, in for instance, <clears throat> in in uh, the other plant I know something about, uh, well, I guess maybe there's three, the oak tree, the pineapple, and the grapevine. In the pineapple, the differentiation from the uh, growing condition, that is the vegetative plant, to one that's bearing a fruit. In the case of the pineapple, it's a monocotyledon, and the fruit is born on the growing point. So in other words, it's growing, and then it must stop growing, and the growing point must differentiate into a new type of tissue to produce a fruit. Well, the way you detect this in the pineapple is that it's, uh, the differentiation is signaled by what they call uh, open heart condition. And instead of continuing to form a whorl of leaves, the leaves will open up and there'll be a, 
a hole down in the heart of the whorl of the leaves, and this hole is red. So there's something about the differentiation from vegetative growth in the pineapple to uh, the fruiting condition that leads to uh, the, the reddening of the center. And, and they use this as, a, if you want to go through the field and find out what percentage of the plants have begun to uh, have initiated the fruit-bearing condition, you can go through and count the red centers, and uh, this way you'll know what fraction of the fruit will be ready, uh, whatever it is, six months later after the fruit is developed. Uh, this is just a simple example of this kind of thing. There are a number of other uh, such cases, and we've mentioned a few uh, examples of uh, uh, leaf color. Uh, there are a few others that might be mentioned, and I think we'll bring some up uh, later on. Uh, seeds may or may not have tannin. It turns out that many don't. All the cereal seeds, like uh, wheat and so forth, are not high in phenolic substances, although a few, like uh, sorghums, the green sorghums, uh, have varieties that are high. In fact, some that are called bird-proof sorghums are very dark red and very high in tannin and anthocyanin content on the outer surface. And the reason they're bird-proof is they're astringent enough that the birds don't like them. And uh, this has another story that uh, I guess is worth a moment of side digression. Uh, the, uh, you may know that uh, grain sorghums when first introduced into this country in my lifetime, uh, at least on a wide scale, were called kaffir corn. And you may not know that kaffir is today a nasty word in Africa because it's, it's the same as the word kanaka to a Hawaiian. It, it originally was a word that meant person but today it means nigger, so uh, you don't dare call anybody in Africa a kaffir or he'll get very angry with you. But uh, kaffir corn was so called because it was the common dietary uh, food of a large part of the native population in certain parts of Africa. Well, there's a section uh, in South Africa called the Transkei where they still grow a great deal of this uh, grain as food, and in the droughty years, and they have a generally a fairly decent rainfall, but it's a climate something like ours, and some years they do have very severe droughts. In the droughty years, they're forced to grow bird-proof sorghums because there are a lot of birds, and they'll eat all the sorghum up unless the yields are pretty high. So if the yields are depressed, then they must grow bird-proof sorghum. Well, the, the payoff on the story is that there seems to be, at least there is some evidence, that they have a good deal more trouble with a rather unusual kind of throat cancer that develops in this region uh, in periods following heavy droughts. And this is believed to be because when they eat these bird-proof sorghums, there's enough tannin and irritation and so on produced. Uh, there's not no clear evidence that the tannins are carcinogenic, thank heavens, but at least uh, there is some ev evidence that uh, uh, this does increase uh, throat injury, which leads to uh, throat cancer. And this seems to vary in incidence according to the droughty periods for this kind of reason. At least this is uh, epidemiologically uh, hypothesized at this point, and it's the kind of thing we need to watch very carefully. I bring this up because I think it has some in interest to a viticulturist. Uh, I'm, I'm speculating very wildly now, you understand, but I think it does pay as a grower of a crop to think about how that crop grew when it was growing in nature. And the grapevine does not grow in nature like we commonly grow it. It grows beside the tree and it grows up the tree and grows in the top of the tree uh, as tall as the tree and eventually it competes with the tree for sunlight by uh, shading the leaves and so on. So commonly a grapevine will eventually kill the tree that it's in. As a consequence, as a Midwestern forester, why one of the first 4-H club projects I had was to cut all the grapevines out of our uh, wood so the trees would uh, produce better timber. Uh, well, this is uh, uh, sounds bad to the viticultures, I guess, considering the grapevine is a weed and trying to get rid of it. But it has some interesting correlations, and in considering that very few plants have high tannin seeds, but the grape does, now what might be the reason for this? Well, it seems to me, if you think of the grapevine, you have a vine growing in a tree, the berries are pretty heavy. If they fall, they're going to fall right under the tree. They aren't going to blow anywhere. And so you're going to be producing lots of grapevines under that particular tree if all the fruit falls there. Now, from a dissemination and propagation viewpoint, it would be much better to have those seeds scattered over a wider area. How are you going to do it? 
Well, why is the fruit there in the first place? It's there to be attractive to something. If it's in the top of a tall tree with no limbs, it's pretty hard for the Indians or whatever to get at it, so it's probably there for the birds. And so when Mayakamas complains that the birds are eating all my fruit, it's only nature acting the way it was supposed to act, probably. It's too bad for Mayakamas and you and I, but nevertheless, that's what the grape was adapted for, I think, was for bird dissemination. Now, why does high tannin have anything in the seeds have anything to do with that? Well, we already said that the bird-proof sorghums are not attractive to the birds because they are astringent and they don't like to taste. So the same thing ought to be true of the seeds. They'll carry the berry off somewhere, eat the berry, and let the seeds fall, and then uh, you'll have grapevines in another bunch of trees, and presumably that's the objective, if you put it that way, of the grapevine. It might even go further than that, because I think we mentioned that the, uh, if you feed grape seeds to uh, animals in a normal diet, actually it'll be a net loss because the tannin ties up the digestive enzymes and the protein of the diet to the point that uh, there's, instead of extra nutrient, you're decreasing the nutrient quality. That being so, it's intriguing that the bird with its uh, lack of teeth and, and a crop to grind the food, you have a very hard seed that might escape grinding in the crop and gizzard and uh, be excreted as a seed, and then it's coated with tannin so it can't be digested. So it does seem that there's a very nice packaging job done by Mother Nature. Now this is all speculation on my part. I'm not quite sure how to go about proving that this is the fact. Uh, in any case, I think it hangs together and make a fairly interesting story and illustrates a point. In, in the tree, there is also an interesting series of uh, developments, and uh, we might as well take a look at an oak barrel stave as an example of a tree, since you're more interested in that kind of thing. Uh, if we look at a tree trunk, uh, the, as I've drawn it here in green, on the outside would be the sapwood, and the heartwood be, would be in the min middle, with, of course, the annual ring, as indicated in the paint. Now the, the rays penetrate from the cambium toward the center of the tree, and as the tree grows larger, the rays extend uh, in the radius of the tree. And the rays form, uh, form the lateral transport mechanism, so anything that translocates from the outside of the tree, the cambium, toward the heartwood must translocate across the tree through the rays, whereas the normal transport is along the tree in the sapwood, as xylem, and in the a phloem, which becomes the bark after it uh, decomposed or after it uh, served its function as phloem. Well, if we analyze the uh, phenolic content, the heartwood is very high in phenol and the sapwood is very low. So that if we draw a graph where this is the outside, now the bark may be high, but this is the uh, bark, sapwood, and heartwood uh, in some time scale, or I mean linear scale like this, with this being the, uh, let's say that's the bark boundary to the sapwood, and then this is the heartwood on through this way. If we plot uh, phenolic extractable material, it may be uh, quite high in the bark, and I don't know about as it approaches the cambium. Of course, the cambium is a very narrow living area between the bark and the sapwood. Uh, then in the sapwood it is quite low and suddenly jumps up as you get to the sapwood heartwood boundary and then commonly slowly falls off as you approach the center of the tree and if this is the center of the tree it would be like so and if you of course go back on the other side you'd get a return to a high level so that there's almost no extractable phenol in the active sapwood where a xylary transport is going on and uh, there is a very high level as you convert sapwood to heartwood. So the sapwood heartwood boundary has, uh, has a very high phenolic content and apparently the reason it falls off from there on is that this is dead tissue and uh, in fact it dies as it converts from sapwood to heartwood and in the dead tissue you have continuing reactions, further polymerizations and so on that go on in the wood as if it were in a solution, say, or at least uh, somewhat similar. So you have the oxidative and aging type reactions occurring inside the wood uh, in the tree and uh, in the dead heartwood, but not in the sapwood. Uh, why does this happen? I think that has some significance. Uh, this means that the 
phenolic precursors are being translocated laterally from the cambium into the uh, heartwood sapwood boundary. And if you take a look at the heartwood sapwood boundary, if this is a tree and, the, and these are annual rings, the, the annual rings of tree growth obviously conform to the outside diameter of the tree because that's, that's what causes the tree to have that shape. Now they may not be uniform, the tree may grow fast on one side and slow on another and so on, but there is some shape to the uh, outside of the tree and that in turn is, uh, reflects the shape of each annual ring, at least of the more recent growth. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a look and say it takes uh, 10 years growth or so to get from the, the, the sapwood, the living section has maybe 10 annual rings in it, and then as you get into the heartwood boundary, you'll find that if the annual rings continue on the same symmetry, the heartwood boundary may not. It usually does, but it certainly doesn't conform exactly to the shape of the annual ring. So that it, it is the heartwood you're forming this year is being formed in wood that may be 10 years old. So the wood was formed 10 years ago, and then you're making it from sapwood to heartwood right now and you don't make it necessarily on an exactly annual basis as far as those rings go. Now that has some bearing on other facts, uh, and it does bring up the point then, what causes a given uh, area of xylem to go from sapwood to hardwood? Well, the best evidence at the moment is that the capillary continu continuity is broken. In other words, in the sapwood you have the uh, tissue full of water, it's conducting uh, sap, and then uh, at some stage, uh, this gets vapor lock if you put it in mechanical terms, and an air bubble enters and the plant isn't able to repair that condition. Apparently it can out here if you make an axe cut or something that gives air bubbles, it certainly can heal that up. But at some point or other, it gives up the ghost or otherwise decides not to repair these uh, uh, air breaks in the capillary system, and then that air uh, means that you have no longer translocation. It, it stops translocation through the xylem and then the tissue dies. It dies and as it dies the uh, lateral transport of carbohydrate or possibly phenolic material to this boundary uh, causes extractives to be deposited in the tissue as it's dying. Now exactly when it's dead in relation to this deposition of phenolic material is a little bit hard to uh, to define, and I don't think it has been, at least if so, I'm not quite able to detail it. In any case, uh, this has, the sapwood has little phenol content and little other, uh, other than lignin, it has little phenolic content <clears throat> and almost no other extractives. So the total extractives here are very low. It's wood tissue with lignin and cellulose, and that's about it plus a small amount of, of uh, cytoplasmic uh, material to keep it alive. Uh, whereas in the, in the heartwood, you may have very high levels, 10% or more of extractives, largely phenols that are deposited in the cells. Now, while we're on that point, one reason the oak is a, a white oak is a very good uh, barrel making material is that these rather large pores, and it happens that oak is called a porous wood because it does have large pores in the wood, you know, the grain of an oak table. I guess none of this furniture is oak, but uh, you know how porous the grain of an oak table or an oak floor looks, and it's because it has large pores. Well, if you got large pores, how can it make a good barrel? If we enlarge one of these pores, as we have this conversion, or at least very soon after the cur uh, conversion occurs, if this is one of these open vessels, which is large compared, and essentially continuous compared to the cells uh, beside it, you'll find what are called tyloses, and there are weaknesses in these cell walls. So this would be a living cell yet, and then this dies, and because it has air contact, it apparently has negative pressure. In other words, you're translocating the water yet, evapotranspiration would remove the water and fill this with air and in the process there's a, apparently a vacuum or a negative pressure produced and you'd get ballooning of the more flexible cell wall material out into uh, these vessels and these balloons are called tyloses and the tyloses would form in sufficient numbers and amounts to make uh, uh, what looks like a foam in the microscope inside and blocks this conductive tissue 
in the white oaks. In the other oaks, it doesn't, and they stay open. So that's why you use white oaks for barrels and not red oaks or some other kind. Uh, these tyloses are, this, this bulging material is apparently plastic at one stage, but hardens and lignifies uh, as it deposits. So it is a, a fairly rigid tissue, and you can actually, uh, with a fine needle and a microscope, you can pick them out, and, and they are uh, firm, uh, firm tissues. Well, this illustrates something about white oak cooperage, and while I have this on, uh, I might as well point out that when you make a barrel, then, what you do is you quarter the log into bolts of the right length for the stave, but you split it from the center outward, and you cut off the sapwood and use only the heartwood. Now, you use the only the heartwood for two reasons. One, it contains the tannin, which helps protect the uh, uh, wood from oxidation and, and mold attack and so on and contributes extractive to wine, but then the sapwood has no tyloses and would leak. So you take the sapwood off for both of those reasons, and the quarter sawed, uh, the quartered bolt is then sawed on the flat face, or split, but today mostly sawed. And quarter sawing means you take a stave from this split surface, which means that it's as near as possible a radius of the tree. Now by taking a radius, they can have these blue drawn uh, rays serving as a barrier to the diffusion of wine or other fluid through the side of the barrel. And it turns out that that makes not only the more impervious, more nearly impervious container, but also makes it uh, uh, less subject to swelling and size changes because the wood swells the least in the direction parallel to the rays. And if the rays are parallel to the surface of the barrel, that means that the circumference of the barrel changes the least with swelling and uh, other changes of the, uh, of the uh, wood during uh, drying and filling of the barrel. Uh, while we're on that point, since I know you are interested in barrels, and we may come back to this for other reasons, I might as well address a little bit further and point out a few other components of this reaction. Now, while I said that the uh, the tree has the most phenol uh, nearest the sapwood, it doesn't have a constant amount depending on where you are in the tree. So that here are some examples that show the sapwood is very low in extractable phenols. These units are in uh, just uh, grams per kilogram of wood, I believe. I've forgotten the exact units. It's not too important. Anyway, whatever they are, they're numbers of phenolic content. Uh, notice that the outside of the heartwood is, is higher than the middle or center in the same tree then, but at the butt of the tree it's higher than it is at the top. So generally the older the tree, and of course in the same tree the top is a lot younger than the bottom, uh, the older the tissue the more uh, phenol there would be in it. And uh, the bottom is generally higher than the top, whether that's due to translocation reasons or whether it's due to the age of the tissue, it'd be a little bit harder to say. Uh, what else do I want to point out from here? I guess nothing else except to indicate that, of course, the bark is rather, rather hot in phenolic content. Now, if we take a look at uh, individual stages and other sources of oak, an individual stave is almost, well, it has to represent an individual tree, of course, and these were staves were from a group, these were 10, I mean, uh, numbered staves out of a group of about 18, and I chose these examples to illustrate points. Now, I don't know exactly what the source of each stave was, but most of them were taken out of one barrel, not all of them, but most of them were from a single barrel, and you notice that in terms of extractable solids, they vary all over the map. Uh, here's one at 10% extractable solids, and here's one at 3.5% uh, uh, extractable solids. And, and that's a great deal of variation tree to tree. Now, if you make up composite samples, which represent many trees, then they become a lot more similar. And if you look across here to flavor contribution, uh, I'll may come back to this later, but if we take a look at the one with the very high extractable solids, it has a very low uh, I mean, a very high contribution to flavor, a low threshold, so that the high solids do contribute flavor, and if there's high solids, it's going to flavor a lot of wine, and vice versa, if we take a low solids one, it takes a lot of that wood, it took a gram of this wood, only a tenth a gram of that one, to flavor uh, to the threshold level a liter of pork, 
So in general, it takes about six tenths of a gram of uh, dry wood to flavor a liter of wine uh, to the threshold level of the particular tasters we were using. And that's a figure we might want to play around with some other time. But in any case, the main point I want to make here is that uh, tree to tree and parts of the same tree, they vary a lot. And it's probably a good thing that the individual barrel generally has about 31 pieces of wood in it. And considering the way they're made, they probably represent about 31 trees, or at least uh, several trees. Uh, and as a consequence, you get an equivalent to a composite value. Uh, otherwise, the barrels would vary tremendously. They vary, vary enough as it is. If it weren't for the fact that you do have a lot of pieces of wood in a barrel, uh, then you'd have a dickens of time blending the wine to produce any kind of uniformity. Then while we're showing these data, I might show this as well. And the main point to be made here then is that the extractable phenol from American oak, French oak, redwood, or cork, uh, and toasted American oak too for that matter, is very high percentage, say almost completely, uh, non-flavonoid material. So it's tannic acid or elagic acid type hydrolyzable tannins, which don't occur in grapes naturally. And therefore, if you measure the non-flavonoid, which we said was fairly low and constant for white wine and red wine, uh, untreated, and then measure the increase, you have a pretty good estimate of whether or not the wine has had wood age. Of course, there are a few other things that could throw you off, like the addition of uh, tannic acid as a fining agent, but barring tannic, tannic acid addition, then you can assume that the, the non-flavonoid increase is related to uh, wood contact. And that, in turn, would be related to the amount of aging or the newness of the barrel. And as I say, if we have time, we'll come back in more detail to that. The main point I'm making in connection with this, uh, other than the interest you have as enologists, is that this indicates some kind of translocation through the heartwood because all the real growth and synthesis of the plant is going on in the, uh, in the cambial layer. Uh, so that uh, even though the sap wood's alive, it's not a very rapid synthesizing uh, tissue, and we would expect then the translocation of something across the sap wood to make this high extractive in the heartwood. Now, what is this translocation? Uh, we don't really know, but there is some evidence that there are phenols being translocated across to here, as well as carbohydrates. So whether the uh, carbohydrates are being converted to phenols in the heartwood or at the boundary, or whether they're converted as phenols and concentrated is still open to question. And apparently both can occur because if you mark, you know, we imagine with trees, there hasn't been a whole lot of radioactive study, but on the other hand, there have been some and it indicates that both conditions can apply. So this brings us then to which phenols will translocate and do they? Well, generally, as we've mentioned a few times already, they don't do not. If you find anthocyanins in a given cell, they were produced in that cell and they haven't been translocated from some other location as anthocyanins, at least. And there are a number of pieces of evidence as to what can translocate. For example, if you uh, let aphids feed on a plant, the aphid has a stylet or a feeding tube that it's able to worm down into the tissues, a surprising distance. It may be an eighth of an inch or even a quarter of an inch deep, depending on the aphid. And considering the size of an aphid, that's a pretty good job to get that deep into the tissue. And then what you can do is you snip the aphid off, which is terrible for his viewpoint, but then the, the, <laughs> tube, the tube continues to exude uh, material, or for that matter, many aphids, as you know, produce honeydew. They have, they have to process a lot of fluid to get what they want out of it, mainly protein so that they excrete a great deal of almost unchained, except uh, protein removed, uh, sap fluid from the plant they're feeding on. So both by looking at honeydew and looking at snipped off uh, stylet fluid, uh, it's been shown that there is very little phenol in these exudates. Not zero, but very little. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some work, uh, for instance, a paper by Ashahira and Nitsch in 1969 working with uh, a uh, yam, Dioscorea batatus, uh, they took stem segments and if they put them in min minimal media and grew or at least maintained them alive in, in minimal agar type media with ammonium ion, uh, they were able to show that they exuded chlorogenic like uh, products uh, which gave a brown diffusion into the medium. 
In other words, the, the cut in in the in the auger, or whatever, there was a chlorogenic like material that diffused out and then turned brown, so they could see it in the auger. And uh, this happened if the uh, uh, stem was put upright, so that it came out the bottom. But if it was turned over, it didn't happen. So there was translocation, and it was in a certain direction, namely bicipital uh, toward the base uh, uh, in these particular tissues at least. And by that sort of evidence, it's been shown that certainly added phenols will incorporate in a translocation type sense. For instance, if you put uh, uh, coniferal alcohol on a cut carrot, you get the uh, phloem tissue to lignify, you know, otherwise uh, carrots don't lignify much, that's why we eat them as, as uh, carrots. If you add to the cut in uh, coniferal alcohol, you'll get lignified carrots, which is no great help from a carrot viewpoint, I mean edible viewpoint, but at least uh, does show that the uh, material is able to penetrate and lignify uh, the tissue. So there is evidence for translocation, but it's usually, apparently, in the form of metabolizable material. Sometimes phenylalanine itself, apparently, uh, some, but more commonly, uh, chlorogenic acid and cinnamic derivatives of phenylalanine, and perhaps even still more commonly, the sugars themselves, and then the conversion would occur in the cell in which you find the flavonoid, particularly at the end. I think that covers the points that I wanted to make with regard to those details. Now let's go to some possible general functions of phenols in plants. And this is a pretty heterogeneous list, and we'll come back to a few of them uh, in more detail uh, shortly. But uh, just running down the list, this light control effect, the sunscreen type of effect that we've mentioned uh, before. And uh, I mentioned it in connection with pineapple, remember, the pineapple leaves and now two overlapping ones, the underneath one was not red, and so on. I think this uh, is particularly important. Uh, what I think is happening is that the anthocyanin in that case passes nearly all the light that the chlorophyll can use but stops the UV light and the other wavelengths of light that might damage the inside of the tissue. And it seems highly significant to me that it's the plants that are having, uh, that have a weak level of chlorophyll, uh, at least those that have been investigated, that generally have red leaves. And there are other examples that relate to this. For instance, uh, uh, in uh, some plants growing in, in um, very shaded conditions, like uh, in, in a tropical rainforest, for instance. There's some uh, middle story or even upper story plants that have red bottoms on the leaves. And apparently the idea is that the chlorophyll tissue has taken out a good deal of the light, and then if you have a red bottom on the leaf, uh, you'll make sure that very little any other light gets through to the plants below. So it's giving you a competitive advantage by having uh, essentially the black condition and if you superimpose the absorption spectrum of anthocyanin and chlorophyll it's pretty much black no light even UV won't get through it much less any useful visible light so if you had a green top leaf you'd be getting all the sunlight you could use and with a red bottom you'd keep any light from getting through the leaf and enough leaves nothing plant life could grow below that plant so it's quite intriguing that uh, some of these uh, plants that grow in that condition have that sort of uh, arrangement of color. I can't give you an example because most of these are highly tropical and don't grow uh, easily here. But there are such examples. Not only that, but we can cite examples in the, in the mountains. So in the Alps, for instance, have been studied certain plants that grow at many elevations. The higher up the mountain they grow, the more flavone or other flavonoid that they contain. And apparently this is, again, a sunscreen effect because as you're rising in the atmosphere, you're getting more UV, more sunburning possibilities, and therefore you produce a, a higher content of a UV absorber, which protects the more vulnerable parts of the plant from the damaging effect of excess UV light. So there are a lots of small pieces of evidence that indicate this is quite important. Um, I'll come back, if I don't forget it, to a corollary in terms of the enzymatic system uh, in this regard that's been investigated in, uh, in a fungus. So even, even bracket fungi, for example, apparently do produce uh, materials of this kind uh, which help protect it from excessive uh, light. 
uh, these materials can raise the temperature, and it's been shown that a red grape berry is a couple of degrees warmer than a white grape berry in, in the sunlight in the summer, and the same thing can apply. So in that case, it might be a disadvantage because it might sunburn more readily, but in a cooler climate, uh, certainly uh, making the tissue warmer by absorbing more uh, light and converting it to heat would be a good thing to do. And this is one reason then, a very indirect reason, why a plant that's trying to make do in the coldest climate it could stand uh, might want to have a high anthocyanin content. So at least it gives some sort of an evolutionary pressure toward the production of anthocyanin in cold tolerant plants. And uh, of course we've mentioned and you know that anthocyanin in the grape is higher when the weather is cooler and uh, since that's contrary to what you'd expect from chemical reaction effects, it's important to explain it. This at least helps indicate why it might, an example of why it might be considered an evolutionary advantage to do that. Uh, the phenols will inhibit certain pathogens, competitors, pests, parasites, and eaters of the plant. And uh, they can serve as toxicants, repellents, vesicants, root exudates, and so on, and toxicants that uh, play this role. We'll have a little more to say about this under plant pathogenicity, but we might as well make a comment or two now. For example, the humic acid, which is the main organic constituent of soil, uh, is lignin degradation products largely that have decomposed to some point but are still polymeric and adhere to the mineral uh, components of the soil and are the main reason that organic soils are good ion exchange agents uh, and has a lot to do with the structure and the fertility of the soil. So that the lignin composition has a lot, or the humic acid which derives from lignin has a lot to do with fertility and structure of soil and a good deal to do with what will grow in the soil. So it has been shown that certain plants will exude from normal roots, not injured roots, into the soil uh, constituents which become inhibitory not only to other plants but even to its own kind. So that an adult plant may make the soil poisonous to even its own seedlings in its immediate vicinity. And this usually happens in, in uh, places of considerable competition where the struggle of the plant is uh, very uh, subject to uh, unsuccess. So that the California chaparral, for instance, this brushy hillside that's very common in California, if you take a look at it, almost no grass or herbal material grows under it. The, the bushes grow, but there isn't anything under the bush. It's bare ground otherwise. And if you cut that chaparral off, depending on the nature of the, of the bushes that you've cut, either you'll get a rapid growth of grasses and other herbaceous materials until the chaparral grows back, or you may find the soil is essentially sterile for a period of time until the toxins have eluded from the soil. And this takes three or four years in the case or more, depending on rain in, in some kinds of plant. And this has been studied to some degree. Interestingly enough, often the components are the same as any plant has, at least as far as we can identify them. It's just more, either more localized. For instance, parahydroxybenzoic acid has been shown to be leachable from some of the leaves of these chaparral plants so that just the rain running off the leaf will have enough parahydroxybenzoic acid to be inhibitory to anything it drips on of a plant type. So that uh, this kind of prevention of competition does seem to be largely related to the phenolic composition. Few other things, there have been a few cases of terpenes and I think one of alkaloids uh, doing the same kind of thing, but generally it seems to be the phenols. Uh, one other example, uh, which might apply in the vineyard, is one reason I bring it up. Uh, they showed that in a raspberry uh, uh, briar patch, whatever they're called, a raspberry vineyard, uh, they, they found that if they uh, ground up the uh, last year's canes, you know, raspberries are like grapes in that the old wood is no longer useful, they prune this back, and uh, if they incorporated that material into the soil, they found that they inhibited the uh, nematodes of that particular uh, uh, briar patch. Uh, Longidorsus elongatus was the particular nematode studied. I don't know whether that's a good one or a bad one, but in any case they were showing that if they incorporated the canes and the tannins therefrom seemed to be the active component, uh, they inhibited the nematodes in the soil. 
and this inhibition uh, was of significance as compared to, say, burning the canes or otherwise uh, uh, destroying them. This might have some utility in a, in a vineyard. And certainly in a natural forest where you have the leaf uh, mold layer of great depth in a deciduous forest and quite depth even in an evergreen forest, uh, then exudates from this material, some of which at least are phenolic, do, I think, have considerable significance in uh, what survives in the soil and help maintain the health of the plant. Phenols, of course, can be attractants to uh, flower color, uh, can attract pollinators. Uh, the flavor can be related to attracting feeding plants so that uh, eugenol in the clove is certainly <coughs> part of its uh, attraction to us as uh, uh, creatures that scatter the seeds, if you want to look at it that way. So this can be a factor. Growth regulation we'll come back to, but it looks like an important function of phenols, uh, and it, uh, we will spend a little time on it. Seed dormancy, and dormancy in general, seems to be related to uh, uh, this condition. And it's been shown that, for instance, uh, high tannin content of seeds often inhibit the germination. So even with grape seeds, they have to be conditioned before they'll sprout. And the conditioning generally consists of soaking in cold water for a period of time, which will leach out a good deal of the tannin. So that uh, whether or not a seed sprouts has to do with how much of the phenolic material has been is present in it and how much has been leached from it. Uh, coumarins in particular are noted for this and uh, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 3, in other words 0 0.005 molar coumarin solution will prevent the or very greatly retard the germination of uh, certain seeds like cauliflower seeds. And this seems to interact with herbicides and hormones in, in contributing to rate of growth and dormancy of plant tissues other than seeds. If you soak ash seeds at 5 degrees and 10 milligrams per liter of ferulic, cafe, perhydroxybenzoic, and a series of other materials uh, of this kind, you'll markedly lower the germination uh, percentage and rate. So there are a whole host of evidences that these are sometimes naturally important and certainly artificially can be uh, very uh, significant in, in germination of seeds. Adaptation to hostile environment is uh, we've hinted at in terms of uh, saying cold survival uh, is important uh, and osmotic effects may be related just to water binding. In other words, the tannins are water holding agents and a high tannin content makes the tissue less subject to freezing. The water, the freezing point of the water is lowered by the high tannin content and less apt to cause disruption of the tissue by ice crystals and so on. So at least uh, Physically, it can have an effect, and maybe physiologically an even greater effect. Uh, I think uh, we won't try to hurry through the rest of these, but there are a few more examples, and we will mention them and then continue uh, from here on in next time.